Our greatest journey is not conquering the mountains, the sea or the space, it's to become fully alive, to have faced adversity and mowed it down, to have stood still in the face of our monsters and watched as they vanish, puff, into the ether. And it's this journey that calls to the hero within every single one of us, heroes like Jeff Gross. Now Jeff Gross is one of the top broadcasters in the world of poker. He's not a bad poker player to boot as well, earning 3.4 million playing live tournaments and a few bob competing in live cash games through his time on the Dirty Green Bays. In this episode, we learn about Jeff's penchant for soccer when he was a little lad, how friendships with the likes of Michael Phelps and Bill Perkins bloomed and make him the person he is today, and how losing the biggest pot of his life turned out to produce one of the greatest opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'll shut the hell up. Leave you in the capable hand of today's hero, Jeff Gross. Jeff Gross, it's wonderful to see you, my man. How are you doing? Doing well. How are you? It's good. Good to be on the other side. Yeah, it's fun. I, I Right. It's exactly. I, I've, I'm so used to uh, doing a lot of podcasts now and, and we just did had you on on my show. So this is uh, this is the reversal. Let's yeah. let's get into it. Let's get into it. All right. So there's this saying that a lot of people say and it goes a little bit like this. Right. So uh, they fuck you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. What do you think of that statement and how did that affect you in your life growing up? Do you think? Interesting. Um. Yeah, I I, uh, I was an only child. I had a great uh, relationship with my parents. You know, I, growing up, um, I thought they were great parents. I, I don't know if they they messed me up, but um, you know, they. Uh, I think I think the biggest thing I think about parenthood and now being a father and realizing that you know you're not always perfect. You're not going to always do the best. You, you you do your best though. I think that's that's fundamentally true. I believe in ninety nine plus percent of the time that parents are doing their best. You know, you don't really know what their situation is in the moment, their work, their personal life, how things are going. And, and I think ultimately parents do their best. And, uh, you know, I think looking back, if you ask parents and, and just people in general, what would they have done differently? What did they learn? They would say that they, they, they weren't the best. They, 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 they could have done better or they would have done things differently. So, uh, I, I don't know, like, um, but, but yeah, I mean, looking back on certain things that they did or how they did it, and, and just what I don't necessarily agree with. They're like, oh, wow. Like I look at pictures or, or stories or just talking with them like, oh man, like that's kind of crazy. Like, how did you do that? Or why did you do that? But I, I think that's, that would be my default answer is parents do their best. Like, I think people are really trying their best, uh, especially with kids. And, and, and you can see, you don't really know how much your parents love you until you kind of have kids and then you realize how much you love them. Um, and, and I think that's sort of what I would say. So I don't know if that's the juicy answer looking if they like, you know, really messed up big time or what they were, what, what I would do differently. But like that, that's sort of my, uh, what my take on it is. When you say, um, you look back at some photographs and say, oh man, what were you thinking? You're not, you're not talking about you being breastfed by your mom while she's having a cigarette and an ashtray dangling on her knee at you. No, just, you know, like the clothes that you had on or the, the haircut they, they chose or, or the, uh, <laughs> the, the toys that you were playing with or, you know, what, uh, tr you know, vacations or trips you took instead of maybe something else or whatever. I don't know. Just like kind of looking back and don't say like, man, I would have done it differently. But again, I think they're doing what they think is at your interest is the best at the time, what you're capable of understanding. Uh, and I think, you know, again, they're, they're looking generally to be unselfish and sort of uh, do the best for what they they think their their child wants. So yeah, that's what I believe. What do you think? Um, being an only child, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a, a lesson in Welsh. You ever ever spoke Welsh before? No, I haven't. Enig blentin adui, enig blentin adui. That is, I am an only child. Okay. I have no idea why I remember that out of my Welsh class, but that is what I remember. There um, you go. Being Enid Blentin Adui, what were the things growing up that you look back and think, ah, oh, man, that was because I was an only child, positive and negative? So I, I actually never even thought about it until maybe three or four or five years ago, something like that, where it came up and someone said this to me, kind of joking, kind of just like as like a real you know, thing. And I started hearing about it more like, oh, you, you turned out pretty well for an only child. And I was thinking like, what's that really mean? And then I started thinking about my closest friends and people I know and almost no one, maybe like one or two out of uh, you know, a vast network of like people that I either knew very well or friends of friends, they all, they were not only child. 
an only an only child. So I started thinking about it, I was like, man, it's kind of weird. Like I, I didn't realize that was like the not normal. Most people do have siblings, and you know, my my wife has a twin sister and two brothers. A lot of my best friends have at least one, if not two, two children. So I started realizing like that is a bit weird. And I started thinking about it, I was like, yeah, it's kind of like I guess that saying means you're maybe a little socially awkward or introverted potentially like that might be the norm or people don't, you know, you don't have that bond or that someone to play with and all the time. But like for myself, I grew up in sports. Uh, I was on teams from four years old playing soccer uh, pretty, pretty seriously. And I always had friends over sleepovers and was just always around people and, and feel I'm pretty socially outgoing. So I don't think that was a problem for me, but I could see why that would be thought like that. Or also just maybe they're too much attention. You're too, too, uh, not really good with sharing those type of things make a lot of sense just as, as a whole. And that's actually something my wife and I are talking about now is like, do we want to have more um, and, and not and seeing pluses and minuses uh, to it. And uh, also, but then we have uh, nieces and nephews that, that are, that are close and, and near us and that they, my son plays with all the time. And I, I'm not worried about it to me. I have no issue or really feel like, Oh, he needs a brother or sister. I do think it's nice to have, you know, there's nothing like family. You can have best friends, mm-hmm. business partners, but there really is nothing like family. So to that argument as well, it's kind of nice to have siblings to share with and, and to, uh, you know, you can't really replicate that bond. So I don't know. I see, I see pluses and, and minuses just like anything. And, and that's something we're considering. Well, your parents must have done a good job if you're, if you're like one of your core values is, you know, family is really important because like I'm the opposite. I'm like the opposite. I'm kind of like, yeah. You know, family to me is like, you know, whoever shows up for me and, and connects with me and shows me love and I bond with, that's like my family more than just these people who like share blood with me. So the, your parents must have had a really big impact on you. What what kind of um, assets did they have that you've brought into your life that you, you even today, you're like, oh, yeah, this is definitely my mom and dad's influence on me. Yeah, I think they were just really positive people, very nurturing, very uh believing, giving, you know, telling me I could do whatever I want. And, and, you mm-hmm. know, for example, with poker, when it was around high school, college, when I started getting more serious into it, there was never any, I don't know, be careful, whatever. Like it was just fully, you know, we support you never even a doubt. And then even my dad got really into poker around when I was in college, just after when I started getting more into it, he started learning it, playing it and, and saying he wished he had played earlier in his life because of some of the values and lessons and, and just, you know, how you can apply it to real life. Uh, sort of like golf. If you golf with someone or not, you know, you see how they handle themselves, winning, losing, um, dealing with variance, understanding risk, all these type of things I think are really valuable uh, to, to, to be able to learn and, and, and poker kind of can teach you and help you with those, those things and apply to real life. Uh, but just always that really the support, you know, they're just so completely supportive. I always took a very uh, outward focus. You know, I played soccer, travel, at a high level growing up. And it was a lot of weekends of the year, you know, all year round where it would be weekends were a tournament weekends were games, two games traveling across the state of Michigan or traveling to different States for tournaments. And, you know, that was a big part of my life from probably eight years old till through, uh, till I left. So, I mean, that, you know, my dad, my parents weren't the ones that pushed me into another kid and they would go like, they literally went to every game, every, they didn't mm. miss a game, you know, maybe one or two, but almost never. And even like with, take me to practices before I could drive, you know, in high school, they drive me and I was on a travel team. So it was uh, three, four times a week going 45 to an hour away each time there and back. So like, it was just really, uh, investing in me in terms of my, what I was interested in and their time, uh, with that. So I think that's some of the biggest things they, they gave to me. Where, where did you grow up and how did the environment impact on how you developed into a person, Jeff? Yeah, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, you know, my, my mom was a librarian part-time and my dad worked at Ford Motor Company as a controller there, you know, finance doing the numbers for, uh, for a plant and Dearborn, you know, and they, they were, uh, we lived in a, in a nice, you know, upper middle class, like nice, just middle class area. And, and, and I went to good schools, public schools, uh, was never, we never had any, you know, financial troubles or anything. It was just, you know, pretty, 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 my parents are very, they were frugal in a way. Like, you know, I was, they would get me like the you new know, place when the new stuff came out, Sega, PlayStation, I would get it, but it wasn't, wasn't excessive. They were very, you know, they were, they, they made me work for my stuff too. Like I remember doing, uh, I would draw pictures, go door to door selling to, to, to earn money. I, 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 when I wanted like walkie talkies, like they would make me kind of work and do chores mm-hmm. and, and, you know, teach values. And I, uh, I just remember, you know, basically 
working for everything that I did. And, and, you know, it's, uh, they, they just kind of gave me a lot of lessons and a lot of values in the area we were in. It was nice. Ann Arbor's a great town. So the college town, University of Michigan, there a lot of sports in Michigan. Um, you know, we used to go to games and, and Michigan football games was like five minutes from my house. And, uh, you know, again, got to, I was pretty, we would go to museums, Henry Ford museum, Greenfield village, uh, go to Bronner's and just, you know, take me around Michigan, take me to different places. And we had, uh, golden retrievers growing up had always two at a time. So that was fun. You know, it's kind of like having a sibling in a way, having the, hmm. the dogs there, they're like part of the family. And that was, that was a lot of fun. And, and I always enjoyed that. So you know, my dad would go play catch, go out in the yard. We'd, we'd hang out. My, my, uh, my mom was, uh, very nurturing and took care, great care of me. And, uh, it was, it was good. I, I, again, I have very good memories from my child. I'm very fortunate that, that all, like I didn't have abusive parents or, you know, they didn't have alcoholism and these type of things. And, and, and I didn't really have a lot of adversity, um, hmm. in terms of my, my parents, they were pretty, 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 pretty good job. I would say overall, like, uh, I, I have no complaints and, and a good upbringing, good area. And I love where I live. I have a, a four-year-old and, you know, they're, there, like this morning she was reading and uh, she's in her own little world and, and I like that and I can just get on with stuff. But most of the time she like wants my attention, right? She, mm-hmm. I, I see like she'll, she'll, she's all right on her own for a bit, but then she gets lonely. Like ha, she's a, an only child in as much as my, my son is a lot older than, and lives in the UK. Did, did loneliness ever show up in your life at all when you were younger or did you, your parents pretty much have that covered? Never, never felt lonely again, just a lot of friends over would go, go to friends' houses, uh, playing on a team. I think that's really important, especially for mm. sort of an only child. Uh, I would think more so to be on a, some sort of, um, environment where you have, you're constantly around people and, and have, you know, get to make friends and get to be people. So I was playing like rec and ed soccer at four years old and, you know, each spring and fall seasons. And, um, you know, I had a, a team who practiced near my house, very like could walk to it. And I just, uh, I was never lonely. That's definitely something I never felt, never felt lonely. And having dogs also was great, you know, like it, cause those are just someone like automatically could play with. You could go outside mm. with it and run around in the yard. We had, a, we had a yard growing up in the backyard and you know, that was, that was, uh, I think that helped probably too. Like I just think like, subconsciously having sort of the dogs around to play ball with, to pet, to, to, you know, just rough house with a bit. And, um, that was great. So I, I kind of say that's sort of like, maybe I had like a half sibling having, having dogs. I think there's definitely some, something to that. You know, I think there's mm. uh there were, there were, there were, they are like family members, you know, when dogs, they, they only live usually 10 years, 14 years. When they pass away, most people take it really hard, almost like a, uh, you know, a family member a lot of the time. And for me, I remember when my dogs would, would get put to sleep or you know, pass, it was very sad as well. And, mm. and, um, but yeah, you know, that was basically growing up. I had, I always had that there as well. Moving into your, your teenage years, most of us have some sort of Achilles heel, even if we are, you know, doing really well. You know, mine mine was spots for sure. I had like acne on my back and my face, and it really affected me socially. My son at the moment's going through this hair thing that he's like really struggling with. What was your Achilles heel coming going through your teenage years? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, I think the the acne thing. I I've, at certain points, eighth, ninth, tenth grade, had some. It wasn't like I didn't wasn't like on Accutane, and it was crazy. But I mean, listen, looking back, it's so funny because high school, in particular, it really is. You see these movies and hear these things. People say it's like very challenging. You know, it's so like everyone wants yeah. to fit in. I can't imagine now with with Instagram and all these different social media things where people know what you're doing and what's happening all times. If like a group of friends or someone doing something like they're posting about it, if you don't get it, like it just got, it's so in your face and it's so, you know, how many followers do you have like this type of stuff? It must be just like, I can't even imagine now, but yeah, I mean, for sure in high school, you know, I didn't drink very much and I wasn't smoking marijuana. Most of my friends were a lot. And, you know, that was a bit difficult. Like I was trying to be focused on sports, uh, when I'd hang out with friends, it was sort of like, you know, to be in the in crowd or, you know, the jocks and like hanging out, but also you weren't, I wasn't really doing all those things. So like, it's kind of awkward. I'd be there, but it's a little bit of peer pressure, a little bit of a, you know, kind of halfway in halfway out sort of situation. And also, you know, for soccer, I did miss a lot of stuff. I had a lot of times on the weekends where, you know, I would be traveling and, and it was a bit of a, a tricky, uh, you know, process to balance social life and, and whatever. But you know, I think I did it all, all in all is a pretty balanced. And, um, you know, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I actually got really into poker. I wouldn't say an Achilles heel, but I had kind of a unique situation where I would miss a lot of school. So I had an acid reflux disease. I don't know if you know what that is, or I guess it was, it was, I had for a while, like maybe for like two, three years, really mm-hmm. terrible. Like 
you've got, I don't know, are you familiar with that? Where you I've heard of it. Yeah. Like I, I throw up, but it's just like yeah. this burping that tastes like it's just this, it's it's honestly like the worst this taste, and like you feel so sick. And it was like that was, I would say that was probably like looking back on it, that was like a two, two, three year period where I had that, and it was very concerning. And I saw a doctor, I had to have my bed like elevated to sleep, and I would get it randomly. Um and, and a f- decent amount, but I ended up like missing a fair amount of school for that uh, at times. And it would be hard in the morning. And also I was playing poker pretty late. Like a lot, I, st- I think in like sophomore, junior year, I started playing a lot of poker. So, you know, I was like up really late. Um, I had that thing a bit. I, I missed a-, a decent bit of school. Um, and-, and I think that was probably the hardest thing to deal with was the, the acid reflux and kind of scary. Look, I just kind of like went away, like hmm. out of nowhere, like before even college, I'd say like my senior year or late junior year, I just like, it just like stopped completely. I think it was like freshman year it started um, and uh, not really sure why or what. And then it just sort of, I haven't had it in, you know, luckily a knock on wood and uh, like, I don't even know, it must've been, yeah, 15, 18 years or something. But uh, that was like a bizarre kind of incident that was really uncomfortable. And, mm. you know, it would just kind of come up sometimes. When you were getting into your soccer, who were the players around that time that were really influencing you? And just let us know a little bit about how far you got and kind of where the dream died, I guess. Yeah, I'm trying to, you know, that was back in the day with the old Ronaldo, you know, like the Brazilian Ronaldo, uh, Luis Figo, Roberto Carlos, Ronaldinho, um, that type of era. Uh, it was it was fun. I, I loved it. I mean, it was a passion for me. I started at four years old kind of, kind of picked up pretty quick, got into it, uh, was, you know, was, I had a great relationship with the coaches all the way growing up was usually captain of my team. I ended up going to the Michigan wolves, which was in Livonia. Uh, so there's basically Michigan wolves or Vardar. Those were like the two elite programs and, and, you know, a little bit far away from where I lived. And I remember going there my freshman year and, uh, and then I, you know, our team, we ended up winning sophomore, junior year, state champions, uh, senior year, we, we lost in the final. So we went win, win, um, second, but I, that was like where I really started going to like the big tournaments, you know, the, the Sun Bowl, um, the Disney, Disney events, blue Cincinnati blue chip. And that's where I got recruited for some, some colleges. And, uh, yeah, we were, we had a great team. It was a lot of fun. I mean, I was, I was, you know, center midfield captain of my team. We were t- ranked number four in the country at, at our peak and we had a great team. And that was the most fun I ever had playing soccer. Like I kind of, uh, just, you know, the, the, that time was, was the best. And then I ended up going to college and I uh, got a partial scholarship, University of South Carolina. Uh, it was the last school I looked at. I wanted to go somewhere warm. I, I was, I don't know, it just kind of like random place. I went, I enjoyed it, went there, really happy it worked out. Like I loved it there. I didn't really get to play much. My coach and I didn't get along. He knew I was sort of the poker guy. He's like Bible belt, old school, been there forever. Like the guy's been there. I mean, he's like the oldest coach in, in the now in the uh been there the most years since day one for the program and you know for whatever reason it was funny because like i got along with my coaches from five years old we were like best friends we'd talk you know would 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 have go over stuff and and uh, i had a great relationship and then all of a sudden in college i just didn't get along with this guy uh didn't mesh for whatever reason and, and i think the poker had a big deal a big thing to do it that he kind of knew that i was doing that a lot and whatever and, and he just never really gave me a, a great shake and uh, i didn't play much so that was sort of where it sort of stopped and really freshman year I kind of had a feeling that was it. You know, I always like grow, it, going into college. I was excited. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm playing well. Uh, I'm, I'm the best in my team. Who's the, one of the best in the country. I was like, I'm going to crush college. I'll, I'm going to lead it in the country and assist. And it's going to be a dream scenario. And I get there. Everyone's really good. Um, poker had become my passion. And I honestly, uh, you know, it was just tricky. Like you're in there, you guys are junior seniors, you know, you're fighting for playing time. These guys are like grown men. You know, you're coming in. I wasn't the fastest guy. I was like a really long stamina. I could run like two miles in 11 minutes, 30 seconds. Um, you know, I could do all the, the, the endurance stuff. And then, uh, I just like, didn't really get a great shake at it. And that was, and I was ha- okay with it. So it was like, it was fun for me. I loved it. I was a, on an ath- I, I was in on an athletic team at a major university and you know, it was a lot of fun. The parties were fun. The team was great. It was like a fraternity, but a little less intense, right? Without like the, the drinking and the, you know, the, the, that type of environment, but you know, you get some perks with being an athlete and, and it was fun. It was just a blast. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it again, anything different. And I just kind of was great. Cause I could play poker all night and I was sort of like into that. And then I would like wake up, not really go that much to classes, uh, you know, go to practice, keep in shape. And I didn't really have to worry about games. You know, I would be like, all right, well, tomorrow's a game. 
not going to play like for at least for a while. Like I got very little playing time until like my junior senior year and even then didn't play much. Um, but it was sort of, it was just cool. Uh, actually one weekend I didn't travel. I think it was my sophomore year and I'd turned 21. Um, and I flew to Atlantic city. I saw there was a U.S. poker open event or USPC. I forget what it's called at the Taj Mahal. And it was like 2007, September 20th or something. And I was just 21 and I found out on like Thursday, you know, didn't make the travel team that week. And I was looking around, I talked to a buddy and, uh, we I flew to, flew from South Carolina to Atlantic city and, and played in this tournament. I got fourth place for a one K buy-in. I actually made a deal four handed and like got, I don't know, I think I won like 18,000 it says 12, seven, but I got like another six K and it was like sick. And I was like, Oh, here I am. I'm in college. I'm partying in Borgata in Atlantic city. I'm, I'm going out to murmur. I hit a tournament for like 20 grand, one money in cash games. And then I flew, flew back like Monday. Um, and, and, and that was just like, it was kind of like the movie 21, you know, these guys are yeah, going yeah. and I'm like, I'm just, you know, I, I had played online a bunch, but I never really played, had a, had a played like a real event live and, and hit, hit a, hit a fourth place. And that kind of got me, I think it was 215 entrance. Um, and that was just fun. You know, it was a great, like that kind of got me into, uh, to tournaments. Uh, and, and that was like where I sort of was like, this is fun. This is cool. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to pursue this more. And, uh, that was basically like the dream of soccer was already, my passion was in the poker at that point. Do you think that, um, cause listening to you talk about your, your, your upbringing was really good. You, you're, um, one of the best footballers in, in your team, you, you, the captain, you're doing really well. And then you, you hit this adversity for like, you know, I'm not saying the first time, but you hit this hard adversity. You've got a coach who doesn't like you. Um, the games are suddenly, the players are tougher and stronger and you have to work harder and all this kind of stuff. If poker wasn't there, like, how would you have handled that adversity, do you think? And did poker really help you with that because you were able to just bounce straight into it? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, listen, I, I considered, it's kind of one of those things that were freshman year, you're kind of like feeling it out. You realize there's not many freshmen really playing. Like I was okay with it and I was still sort of really motivated, working hard, dialed in. And then after like sophomore year where like things weren't really clicking still, I felt like I should be playing. You know, I was the practices were going really well. I thought like at times I was one of the best players in practice, play a lot of small side of games. My coach actually said in our meetings, he was like, if this, if, if, if it was eight on eight, like if the games weren't 11 on 11, the fields were a little smaller, eight on eight, you would be on the national team. So he gave me like a really high compliment in one of my things, but like didn't really make sense to me. And then I just didn't get to play or a chance. And I just felt like I could do a lot, even if it was like just playing like, you know, 15, 20 minutes or take coming in and, you know, play a bit. And so, you know, that was where I was kind of like over it. And I was like actually considering transferring. But at that time I had made some really great friendships, you know, like my buddy, Io Akinsetti, he's from the UK. You know, he, he was, he almost played in the premiership, didn't quite make it, came there. He was one of the best players. And like, I would go over to UK with him once or mm. twice a year. And his friends were on the like West Ham United at the time. I was like Nigel Rio Coker, Anton Ferdinand. Those were like who he grew up with in the West Ham youth system. And like, mm. I was having a blast. We were hanging out there. I had other really good friends on the team. I, I loved it. I was literally playing poker and just having a blast. And, you know, I don't know if I, I think if I didn't have poker, I probably would have worked harder. I probably would have been like, all right, you know what? I'm going to hit the weight room and do all the extra stuff and, and, and just like give him no alternative. Or I probably would have transferred, you know, if soccer was still like, there was nothing really else that stood out to me as a passioner, you know, cause even business at that time, it's sort of like, whatever, like you're learning, you're in college, you can't really like, you're not really, you know, maybe you drop out if you have a business idea and you want to do it. But like, I, I was, uh, I might have, I think I would have transferred probably would have been mm -hmm. like what I would have done and tried to go play at another university. It's kind of funny too. And there's so much luck and variance and butterfly effect. Right. But like if I had gone for, let's say one of the eight other schools, I was, I had taken official visits to that I was looking at, I might've played and been, been a star, uh, player there. I may have like, mm -hmm. you know, if some of the colleges I'm looking at were even like Bucknell or division three or Stanford, um, Stanford's pretty good. I mean, that, that also maybe not there, but just like some of the areas I could have maybe gone to a different school and stood out or had a way better chance and played more. Um, but I think I would have explored those options if I didn't have poker. That, that, that's likely what would have happened. It's funny now. We look where we are today and, and we just like, yeah, we did all right. We, we, we made, we made, it worked out okay. So that's yeah. the main thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's funny how you make decisions and how like a little, little moment or meeting or, you know, like it's just so random, right? Like this coach sees me play, at a tournament, like on the last day in a thing, ch chats with me, sends me an email. He's the last visit I look at. It wasn't really even on my map. I'd never even heard of University of South Carolina. Like he just mm -hmm. didn't register with me. 
went there. I was like, man, I love the weather. Saw some pretty girls. And I was like, you know what? I think this, this route is going to be a little more laid back education wise too. In terms yeah. of going, like my dad went to Penn, my mom went to Brown, like Ivy league background. And you know, I know how much work in Michigan, even University of Michigan, which was like the next, my next up choice. This is my backyard though. I didn't really want to go where it's cold. I've lived there for 18 years. Like so mm. many people I know are going there. It'd be like going to another fifth year of high school in my opinion. So, you know, I don't want my parents where I can drop my laundry off and they're, it's just like, it's just not really authentically college in my opinion. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people love that. You know, Brazil culturally too, people live at home. They don't, you know, they go to school, they're in, they're in through college. They don't even leave till they're married. So it's all different, but I was kind of set on a new environment, uh, a new challenge, a new area, and, and just wanted to go somewhere different. So that was, that was, uh, that was a big, that was important for me and kind of South Carolina ticked a lot of the boxes for that. So you, you started playing poker really young. So how did you get into it? What was it uh, through a TV advert? Was it through somebody you saw on the internet? What was it? I, I mean, honestly, it was at a team soccer camp at the University of Michigan. So I was playing at Pioneer High School. One of my good friends, Craig Fister, brought a, a chipset, just like, you know, those red, white, and blue ones you put yeah. like the grocery store, just the plastic ones. He brought it there. I think it was right at the summer, I believe. It must have been 03 or 02. I think it was 03 because like Moneymaker was on TV. It was like ESPN had just started having I, I then watched Rounders, I think like that week as well. And like I was doing well in the games. Like I, I always like board games, video games. And so mm. I played a little chess when I was young. You know, there's a big chess craze now with uh, Queen's Gambit and people talking about it. It's getting more popular. But um, you know, I played a little bit of chess with my dad when I was young, but I'm really bad. Uh, I just never really got into it. But like, you know, all those games, I played all the board games, all the video games. And I remember a Sprite commercial where it was like really funny where these guys were, they were playing a video game and like one of the guys is celebrating and they have this like cartoon lo- character for Sprite be like, what'd you, what'd you win, man? What'd you win? Like he wins the video game. Now there's Twitch. Now video games and esports are, are massive. But like back in the day, you know, you don't get anything. There was no, you play a video game and you were good at it. Maybe there was like a Madden challenge or like some little promotion like to win something, but it was just way different. And the point was like, all right, I found a game where you could actually win money. And I was just getting into something that, you know, money became, started to become a thing in high school, you know, my parents give you a little allowance, you go to school, you go out to lunch sometimes, you know, whatever, but there wasn't really, you know, the money had just started to become on my radar of something that I was interested in and, and wanting things. So it was just like the right place, right time. And I had a, I had a decent knack for it. And against the people I was playing, you know, I was, I was winning fairly consistently, but again, I didn't know what a big blind was. I didn't know what position was. I didn't know bet sizing. Uh, and then I read the theory of poker and then someone transferred me $50 online on party poker actually, which now it's nice. Cause that's why I'm sponsored with kind of came full circle. That was the first ever money got mm-hmm. on there. I love this software at the time. You know, I, I forget, I probably had $50 sent to me a few times. I don't remember. It's not you know, like, it wasn't like the first time and I just ran it up, but I got into affiliate business then where you could refer friends, got really deep into that. And, and that was sort of more in college, but this was, it was just great. Like I was playing 25 cent, 50 cent with my friends coming over to my house. I do tournaments. I'd go to some other games. One of my best friends, Chris Iannuzzi had a brother at Michigan. We would go play in their games. Like after about six months or a year, we'd go up there, we'd be on campus playing with like, you know, a little bit older guys and playing in their games. And I was beating them fairly consistently. Uh, and it was just fun. You know, it was like a really fun time, um, starting out and, and, and playing poker. And it just happened fast. I became immersed with the game for sure. Don't press that fast forward button, have some respect. If it wasn't for the likes of Run It Once Poker, Jeff Gross and I wouldn't be sharing these nuggets of wisdom with you, so just hear me out, okay? We have gotta give him a shout out because Real Poker is an online poker room for players created by players. And if that appeals to you, then head to once.run forward slash hero play today and you can pick up a 100% welcome bonus up to a ceiling of 600 euros. There are two elements of this deposit bonus that make me want to go and join a training camp with Michael Phelps. First, it never expires as long as you play one hand every 30 days. And second, all of your deposits during your 30 days count towards the bonus. So remember that URL, once.run forward slash hero play. When did, uh, if we were looking at your life as a movie, you know, and uh, there will be an inciting incident where we look at it and we say, oh, is Jeff going to make it as a poker player or not? When was the moment where there was a bit of crunch in terms of, am I going to be a poker pro or am I going to work in some business or am I going to get a job? When was that moment, Jeff? I never had, a, I never really had a time where I was like debating to not because I just, it was just one of those things where I was in college. Um, I was playing online 
playing, playing, doing okay. And I didn't really ever have a, I was like, by the end of college, I was pretty deep into it. And I was, I'd already had a little bit of a bankroll. And then, you know, I met, so I actually, Michael Phelps, the swimmer, it was my roommate for seven years. I met him in 2006 at a poker table in uh, mm-hmm. Windsor, Canada. It was called Caesars Windsor. Now it's Casino. No, it used to be called Casino Windsor. Now it's Caesars Windsor. But I met him there and we, we you know, we hit it off and then kind of became very close. And then he was saying, you know, come move in with me right when you're done with college. He lived in Baltimore. He was training there. He had this, you know, this nice townhouse to himself. I was at South Carolina. He actually drove to South Carolina and then came, drove back from me. We took like some of my furniture and everything like that when I graduated in December of 08 and then moved right in with him in that time. Uh, and, and he was like, he would take pieces of me, stake me for a little bit on some of the stuff I was doing. So I kind of, I had, I wasn't really stressed or worried. And it was kind of like, I've always been in school. I've always played soccer since I can remember. So I had these two major responsibilities and now it was just like, all right, not like I'm just free. I have no Mm. soccer. I've got no school. And, you know, I'm living with Mike. He was in like, you know, this was the peak. He just won eight gold medals in 2008. He's like, kind of has his downtime period, a bit of like not going so hard. And it was just a blast. Like, I mean, it couldn't have been more fun. I didn't feel any pressure. And then in 2009, I hit a, I guess the moment though, that to, to answer your question about timing and, and wise was like, I had never thought, oh, I need to do something or it's going to, you know, it's going to be trouble. Cause I was playing online doing okay. And I had a little bit of money and I was, I had made a bunch of money in these affiliate programs on party poker, which was like my whole business model in my freshman, sophomore year of college. That's where I really got my role. It's crazy numbers. What, what you could do for signing up people there. And, uh, but then I hit a hundred K score. I got a hundred and nine thousand dollars score and a one K buy-in in 2009 at the world series. And basically my, my first summer out there, uh, I think I was 21 or 22, um, maybe the first summer I didn't play many tournaments. I was just in Vegas, played one or two, but here was like my first summer. And then I hit that, that 109 K score. I got fifth in a one K. Um, I think it was like, yeah, 3000 people. And you know, that was huge. Like that was just like instantly I was playing like 500 to $200 buy-ins, hundred dollar buy-in tournaments online, 33 rebuys. I was playing like $1, $2 cash. And all of a sudden I just hit like a hundred K score. Mm. I think Mike had half, but you know, either way, like I had a great summer and, and just like now my role was like bigger. I was like, wow, this is real. You know, it's like a real score. Um, and that was sort of my first like stamp, my first take on like, all right, this is real money. It's a chunk of money. The game is thriving. Numbers are rising. Uh, online poker in the US was picking up everywhere. You know, there was de- like, I just really felt like that was, you know, that was sort of like a stamp that, that, that made me not ever really question the time. I would like, if say I came back, I bricked out Vegas. I had, you know, I was needing to be staked fully. I I had basically no money. Uh, Then maybe things would be different. And I would have said, Hey, you know, this maybe it's not for me or I got to think of something else or whatever. But, you know, I'd already sort of gotten into business a bit and and sort of starting some other like affiliate programs and, and, and doing some other side things at the time. And, And I was just comfortable. So I didn't really have to worry about that. Luckily. Yeah, if you if you love something with a passion like poker and then you get a hundred K score, you you ain't going back to anything else, right? I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. like think like how much is that gonna keep you just even in rent at Mike's place and li- feeding yourself? You've got what, you know, like a couple of years like easy street, right? So I can see how that happens. What well, what was it um what was it like living with Mike? at his peak. So he's the greatest Olympiad of all time. And you're living with him, right? So I know I've got this kind of idea in my head that it's fucking crazy with paparazzi everywhere and stuff. Um, but what was it like? Tell us. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, I could do a whole podcast on, on my time with Mike. Cause like, you know, those were, those are the years again, life is so much about stages and, and you get these different pockets, right? You're in high school, you're in college, then you're out of college, you're single, you're, your girlfriend or, or whatever, or your, your fiance, and then you're married and then you have kids. And it's just funny. Cause it's like, these are just different time periods. You know, things you're doing in different pockets. You're not hanging out with your single friends when you're married. You're not, when you're, when you have kids, you like hang out with people who have kids because like it's yeah, different yeah. Like, how crazy it is. Like you're not, it's just, it's just different things. So, you know, this period is special to me. It stood out. Like, you know, it was, it was, I have, I have stories and trips and, and things that, you know, just like, I'll never forget. And, and some amazing memories. I mean, just say the one that, that stood out the most was probably, and, and, and I mean, I could just give you a little overview of what it was like to live with him. So he played poker a lot. You know, he would, mm. he would, he would train twice a day. He'd wake up at five or five thirty, go train at, you know, six, 
crush a workout. He'd come home. Usually I would be sleeping uh, pretty till like noon or so. Cause like I would play poker late and uh, I would, uh, you know, he would then we would, I'd wake up, I'd either start some tournaments or we'd hang out a bit. And then I would, I would start, he would go to a second workout and then he would come back and then he'd either hop in like the nightly schedule with me. Um, and I'd play, you know, pretty late if we both got knocked out or some days we didn't, we'd go to dinner, have friends over, play beer pong or whatnot. That was very common. You know, he'd have activities and, you know, Mike was, you gotta understand like Mike is, uh, he was, he's the most disciplined guy. He didn't miss workouts for years. He would work out every day, even Christmas for years, but you know, the guy would have a good time too. And he would, um, you know, he would, he would have, he would have fun. He'd have friends come over. We had a, we had a nice group there. Uh, and, and, you know, I was, it was interesting for me though. I was, like I said, I just was out of college. I was out of my responsibilities. I was drinking a fair amount, like just, just in general, I would play beer pong or whatever. I was eating terrible. I'd order Chinese food. I'd be playing online poker. And this was before they even had like synchronized breaks. You know, I remember like <laughs> a five minute break at the, at the time, but it was just like chaos. I was playing a lot and, um, you know, it was wild, but I'll just say like, for example, in 2008, I went to the Beijing for the Olympics and that was an experience I'll never forget. And I mean, I remember, you know, the night Mike won his eighth gold, we, we went to a, like a celebration thing they had for him and you go there and you got, you know, we, we walk in and everyone's just going, it was just crazy. Like it was honestly out of a movie and then walk over and then there's Kobe and LeBron. They're there waiting for Mike to congratulate him. We did a shot with them. They had a game the next day, you know, and the U S basketball obviously was just like, it was like a, a playing kid kindergartners. Like, so they, but they were out there. It's just like moments you'll You'll never forget. And I actually went on, we went on and flew around to a few different places, Portugal. Uh, we then flew to the UK to do like the ceremony he did. And I actually was in my, I had another semester of school still. So like, this is like August of 08. My school started August 12th or something. I came back like September 1st or no, I came back. Yeah. yeah. I came back like August 27th or something. And so I'd already missed like three weeks of school and I emailed all my professors like, Hey, look, I'm, I'm out. I'm on. I'm not, I'm not going to be back for a bit. Let me know. And I'll never forget. I came in uh, my first class I came back to and I walked in and they were taking a test for like the first three weeks. And my professor was just like, Hey, you know, it's okay. Like I'll wait your stuff for, for the rest of the course. We'll take this one out. And actually Mike came and gave a speech to my class, like one of those big, you know, 120 person yeah. class, like auditoriums. And he, that was one of my teacher asked, like, could, could he, if he's here, could he do that? And he did it. And like, that was huge for me. You know, I'm not going to say I wouldn't have passed or whatever, but like he, mm. you know, he definitely helped out and it was just, it was just fun. Like having him come and visit at South Carolina, there was that infamous bong uh, incident, you know, like, which is funny to look at now. It was like such a big deal. And he got so much shit for it. That was there at South Carolina visiting me. And, you know, the, now it's like marijuana and cannabis is legal everywhere. What's yeah. this? Uh, what year is this? This is 12 years later now, 10 years later. Things have changed a lot. And it just shows you how crazy it is. But um, it's a, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was a wild time, obviously. He was very, he, at that time in 08, he was probably the most famous person in the world for a period of time. Right after those Olympics, no one had ever won eight golds. And, you know, to kind of be there right with them, see the highs and lows and, and be around was, uh, you know, something that's just unique. It was, there's nothing you can say. It was, uh, it was a, it was a very exciting time. And, um, you know, it was again, things I'll never forget. And we had a lot of fun mm. and, uh, still talked to him a lot actually during quarantine, talked to him probably four times a week, you know, FaceTime and, and catch up. Sometimes those pockets, like you won't talk, I won't, we won't talk for a couple months. Um, mm. you know, he's got three young kids under five. I got a 19 month old, um, busy times. And again, you, you just like, don't really in the moment, I remember thinking, cause Mike loved poker so much. I was like, this is amazing. Mike's going to finish in probably 2012 will be his last Olympics. We're both single kind of at the time, whatever, like we'll, we'll travel the world, play poker. It's going to be amazing. And then, you know, next, you know, he's engaged next day or whatever. He then, uh, you know, I get engaged. I, I have a, I get married. He gets married. He has a kid. Now I have a kid. He has three kids. It's just like, and, and it's kind of a, a wild time, like where it's like, you're out, you're fighting. You know, we visit each other now and again, but it's just like things change, right? It's just like yeah. your family becomes your priority. And um, like I said, it's why pockets are, it's important to cherish different times and periods of your life. Cause like everything's different, you know, it just, it, the time just goes and things get crazy. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting how life works and how, um, you know, you got to really be in the present moment and, and appreciate things. Cause as you know, you have a son who's older, your child's mm -hmm. four next thing you know, they're out of their diapers they're talking, they're walking. Then it's, they have phases. They want to be with their friends. Then they go to college. Then they're, you know, so it's just like, you just got to really enjoy the the time. Cause I, I just like realize that different, different windows really do go fast. Yeah. Go very quick. What, what, 
what was it like for Jeff Gross psychologically hanging around with the most famous person in the world? So I'm interested in like how how I know there's a, there's a whole just being swept away with it. So I'm in Beijing, I'm in Portugal, and there's LeBron. So there's a whole tangible physical aspect of it. But what goes through your mind? Because I can, I, I know for myself, like when I was younger, particularly and more immature, there were definitely I was definitely into external validation. So I need people to love me and to like me and yeah. all this kind of thing. So like, what was going on through your head, hanging around with this super um, superstar? Really, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I remember one thing that stood out to me is he was basically like at one time where he was he was feeling you know things. You know, Mike's done a lot of work with mental health and he's the face of uh, some of these stuff. And you know, it's tough though. Cause like there, there's like a fine line, right? Like, I think it's cool to want people on autographs or like, listen, I do Twitch now and it's fun to get validation. Exactly. It's love is someone to say, I love your video or, Hey, I learned, you know, I'm in poker because of you or mm-hmm. now, you know, that stuff's cool. But like for him at certain levels, you realize like that there's like a fine line. Cause like, like he was saying, trust me, you never want this, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's just like too much or whatever. And obviously it's different during Olympic years or thereafter and he's you know had less of that probably now but uh i you know i i remember also it was like a weird mentality you know because it's like i'm essentially if you look at the movie entourage or the the show it's i think it's very similar to that like i i would equate that where you know, mike has an agent he's got his family he's got uh you know manager publicist stuff and then he's got his kind of his friends and, and such but you know it's like you're almost like an entourage you're part of his his team and a support system and he needs people he can trust not just like even an agent or other people like he needs his friends. He's had a lot of crazy shit. People trying to extort him or, you know, whatever, take advantage of him. I could, there's stories of like wild stuff, like just stuff you wouldn't even believe. And this happens, I'm sure all the time to people, but like it happens more when you're well known and, and, you know, people are looking to take advantage. So yeah, I just like saw a lot of that. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, trying to be, be there for him, but it was kind of got awkward for me too. Cause I got around that time, you know, I was sort of really trying to support him, be available and, and be a friend. And again, I'm living with them. There's a lot of benefits. There's a lot of people, a lot of opportunities you get, a lot of people you meet, but like yeah. also wanting to not be a sidekick, you know, for a long, for a few years, I feel like I was known as like Michael Phelps, best friend, you know, mm. which is like, okay, that's fine. I get it. Like it's, you know, there's a disparity, like the guys, like, uh, you know, it's just how it works. Right. But then I was kind of like, well, I'm motivated. I want to do my own stuff. I want to build my own kind of brand. I want to travel. I want to play in stops. Cause like a lot of time we'd play local cash games, uh, or hang out. But like at some point too, I was like, Oh, I want to play the world poker tour stuff. I want he can't do this stuff because yeah. he's at home and he's training. So it's like, do I, le- it's in a way it's almost like, am I leaving him alone or, or, or like, does he kind of need a, su- a friend support system there? Like, do I go and play these events? When I, I remember always going to Vegas for the summer, it was, uh, you know, like the Olympic years too, or it, he, every two years was like a big, big summer for him. Right. He would either have worlds, which was like in Rome, Shanghai, which I would go to as well, or, you know, Olympics, Beijing, uh, London, Rio. So like every two years there was basically, he was gone. He would go to Colorado for like a month or two. And it was amazing timing because that was when the world series was. So like I would go to Vegas and, and, and it actually really worked out well because the Olympics were in August and the big events would be in August and Vegas was like June, July. So he would be in like lockdown training in like militant training for this period. And I would go to Vegas and he would always have a piece of me and sweat me and it'd be fun. He actually flew in one time while he was at Colorado, he I made a final table in the World Series. He flew in. I made a WPT final table. He flew in to sweat it. So you know, he was really into it, and he loved poker. But uh, it was, uh, you know, it was just kind of like one of those things too. Where I wanted to do my own stuff and be my own person, but I was also kind of like, you know, it's almost like a role in itself when these guys, like these, you know, these type of major personalities. Um, they need, they need people to talk to and support them and help them and stuff. Cause it's a bit overwhelming, I think. So I, I don't know, I guess there was like, if it, that answers your question, I mean, it definitely was a bit of like a, you know, this is like enough and exciting enough and there's some stuff, but also I want to not just ride off his coattails and, and just sort of be a bum, if you would like, just sort of like, just be around and not do anything. So yeah, I think that was an interesting sort of uh, dichotomy and trying to figure out what was right and how to do it. And, and uh, you know, honestly, Black Friday, that was sort of like a, a big moment. That was, I think, April 15, 2011. And that was sort of when like, okay, now I can't just sit at home and play online poker. I need to get out there. And that was maybe the best thing that ever happened to me. And in the moment, um, that seemed like such a tragedy and so terrible because mm-hmm. it was like such a shift. And I know it affected so many people. Um, again, could be good or bad, but in the moment, it seemed like the worst thing and, and really it just turned out to be uh, sort of the best thing for me and sort of shifted what I was doing and how I was doing it and where I was doing it. And I think that was a big, uh, 
big kind of yes moment for me that sort of really turned into something nice. What were the, what were the, um, as you, obviously you, you didn't make a decision to become a pro poker player. It just kind of happened. Um, but for people looking in, you were like, you know, how, how did Jeff make it? How did he turn this into his business before you started getting into broadcasting? What were the things that you did really well in, in order to cement yourself as a professional poker player? Like what were the, the fundamentals building blocks that you put in place to make sure that you could flourish? I think, I think really was just business, uh, sort of having supplemental incomes, you know, the, the affiliate programs, being savvy to that, understanding people were doing well with this. This was something that you could take some time, set up a web page, um, make some money from other than just by playing, you know, poker got tougher. And again, I wish I had done more work back then on my game. And even now, you know, looking around and you see like the elite, elite cash game players, the elite, elite tournament players. Like I feel I'm a very good poker player, but you know, I know when I match up with, you can name off 20, 30 guys, right. That rattle off. Like you just say, take the Triton series, high rollers guys that are like the, the professionals there. You know, these guys are doing peel solver work. They're doing massive studying in groups. And you know, my, my model is different a little bit with the content and with kind of everything I do, but I think it's important to be realistic on your game and be, uh, be understand that, you know, what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. And to realize there's a reason that the guys that are that are at the absolute absolute top are doing some different things. But again, also to to sort of hit on your point, it's also important to to uh, find good games. There's other things. Network. You know, you could be the the tenth best player in the world and be in the worst spot ever if you're playing nine. You know, a, a, a game with with the say eight handed with seven of the best, right? You're, mm-hmm. And it's not good. You could be the 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 eight hundred thousandth best player in the world and be in the best game of all time. So I think that's also being realistic. Uh, game selection, networking, and and you know I've I've actually I'll take a second to say I've heard some different stuff and people have different opinions and of course like I don't know your whole story I don't know everything about you don't know everything about me you can make generalizations very quickly right you can look at someone or look at how they do or what they're doing or whatever and say stuff and I've heard other things too you know like people say oh he's like you know, the guy's networking or there's a lot of confusion about the, um, the cash game scenes. Right. And it's like, now it's very, it's very, it's gotten brought to light. It's just part of the system where it's like, all right, there's private games. Those are, those games are generally really good. So it's like, it's important to try to get in those games. But like for me personally, you know, it happened to be my network of people, whether they're professionals that have access to the games, also my friends, you know, who I've met or, or some people that I've become super close with have, you know, play big or are not pro players and whatever. So you know, people can look at things or say, say things, however they want to maybe perceive it. Maybe they're jealous. Maybe they just want to hate. Maybe they want to just, they don't know. And they just want to create controversy. But I think that's a, uh, something I was very fortunate that some of the opportunities I've had were in some good games with people that happen to be very close friends of mine, um, that I've played and done well in games. And, and that was also, you know, at the time in like 2012, 13, getting to play some of the biggest games in the world, or at least that I was aware of in the U S uh, and was pretty, pretty fortunate. Um, and, and also kind of maybe again, if I wasn't doing that, who knows, maybe I wouldn't have felt comfortable to stay in poker or felt that it was lucrative enough. And I might've found something else, but again, just kind of like the different stepping stones the different opportunities. And then, in, you know, to kind of jump then into Twitch and I pivoted mm-hmm. as well in 2014, 2015, I guess it was, um, early 2015 when I sort of saw Twitch and I saw what was happening. I realized I met my wife at Burning Man, uh, we're now married and we have a son, but like, I realized, you know what, it's not really feasible for me to fly to Houston twice a week anymore. And what if this game stops or what if this dries up or what if whatever, I want to be able to do something that I can control, that I can build my own brand. And I, I realized I kind of had to shift and pivot. And, you know, that was a little scary to sort of start from scratch on something that I didn't really know how it would go, but mm-hmm. you know, I had a vision and idea and I thought it would suit my personality. And you know, that I, I'd say like the different, different parts of my poker career, being able to sort of foresee things and, and get a, get a whiff of them and, and, and just really go for it. I think that's been, been very pivotal. And, you know, I don't think people realize in 15, 16, there was only a few people, Jason Somerville, Jamie Staples, you know, Kevin Martin, some of these guys that were successful on Twitch had these channels, were doing something it hadn't caught on, you know, still poker stars. And these models were, we want to, we want to sponsor the biggest name who's won the biggest tournament. But now, you know, you see guys, a, a site would much rather have a guy playing $20 MTTs that has 30,000 plus following on Twitch and is active on social media. than you know, a guy like, uh, again, I could just throw out names, guys at worst spot. It doesn't matter. Right. Like a big yeah, name yeah. Pro that now doesn't have a deal because like there's a dime a dozen guys that are winning these high rollers 
And, uh, you know, there's some of them that are very active and do great work and promotion. Some don't, and, and that's fine. That's just who they are and what they're focused on. Maybe they're spending all their time studying and working on their game. Some guys are doing a mixture of both. Some are just more content. So, you know, that's, uh, the, the industry shifted, I think in general and what's happening. It's, uh, you gotta always be alert to sort of what, what the, what, what the, what's happening and, and look ahead. All right, is stuff closing? Am I going to be able to do this from here? Uh, what is it going in the U S so sports is becoming big. Um, you know, private clubs are big on like, you just kind of have to always have your eye and stuff and, and be open to change. Cause I think that if you just sit and, and if you're set in your ways, um, you know, you can get just left in the dust or just get blindsided if you're not really aware, uh, to what, to what, uh, what, what's happening within your industry. What was it like when you was playing in uh, the really big games? Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, are you able to say, I mean, I know sometimes this is difficult, yeah. but are you, are you able to say about who was playing and uh, how it all worked and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I've played, I played some big cash games, you know, 200, 400 pretty consistently, no limit. I've played as big as 1K, 2K, no limit. Um, you know, again, various deals, whether it being staked or having uh, selling action, same thing with hundred thousand dollar buy-ins, you know, 12, 13, 14, I'd say that was sort of like the peak of my tournament career. That was when like alpha eight started, you know, Bill Perkins, I was playing a big cash game in Houston. I actually met him at a personal development course in uh, Vegas. Antonio Esfandiari went to it. He told me about it. Bill went to it. It was one of the best things I ever done. Like I met Bill, we, we really hit it off. And next thing you know, I was like coming to Houston, we were hanging out. I didn't even know who Bill, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know anything about him. I met him there and, you know, I started going, I was playing this huge cash game. I was flying in once, twice a week. I'd stay with him at his family's house. We became very close, you know, his daughters, his, his wife, then everything. Like it, it was just an amazing, like sort of everything started happening. And then all of a sudden I was like playing hundred K's uh, and, and, and doing all that. And it was, it was fun. You know, it was just like a wild time. I hadn't met my, my wife or I didn't, I didn't have a relationship. I had no, I was bouncing around playing poker, flying all over. And I, it was a blast, like playing massive, massive games, you know, hundred, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollar pots. Um, so that was also cool. Cause it kind of taught me, you know, it was a different level of, uh, I played 25, 50 sometimes, but this was like a new stratosphere and like you know, the nerves and sort of like, even though it wasn't all my money, it was still very intense, and very exciting. And the people, you know, you're, you're, it's like car cartoon characters and, and make believe it's like you got the CEOs of these companies and the biggest guy in real estate doing this and oil and, you know, celebrities and athletes and different people you're meeting and, and just, you know, gambling with, uh, it was pretty surreal. And, and that was, uh, you know, that was, that was something I was doing for a while. And like I said, when I met my wife, and then it was sort of like, well, she doesn't really like Houston, not going to live in Houston. She wants to live in, in either Brazil or Miami, these different places. And like, it wasn't really feasible to fly in twice a week and do this. And I, at that point, basically made a decision. I was like, all right, I'm going to do it last. I'll maybe come once a month, do less. The game was a little smaller at the time. Even at this point, it, it had slowed down a bit. And, and then that's when I said, you know, I'm going to start Twitch because this is something I can actually build on. I can have, because again, the, the private games and all this are great. But those games change. Like it takes one or two people that aren't playing, or yeah. the game dries up, or something happens, or someone stiffs, or this and that. And there's not. Listen, it's great, and you can make some money, and you can use that to do other things. But again, you're not really building a foundation when you play in private games. You might network, make some relationships, but that that there's no like. The thing I love about Twitch is there's a history. There's there's a there's a there's there's numbers. There's data. There's there's a brand. There's opportunity, and you kind of like create something for yourself. It's like your own business, and and that was very attractive to me. And just again, different different. I still play some big games now and again. I'll play big cash games and mix it up. It's not part of my my uh, my everyday thing. You know, I'll still play play some private apps. I'll play some some big games uh, here and there. And obviously, COVID's been a weird. You know, this is now the time just flies, right? This is years basically gone. And you know, I was, uh, it seems like six, seven, eight months since something's happened, but, um, yeah, it's a long time. I haven't seen my hard son. Hard. I haven't seen my son for coming up to a year, you know, Crazy. cause I, cause I, I, I don't want to leave the country. Um, in the, the, with the bill, we'll call it the bill Perkins era. Um, I'm really interested. Uh, I, I have friends who are, um, multi, multi, multi millionaires and, I'd be lying if it didn't affect me in in some way or another, right? Like it, mm -hmm. it does. It it I I I'm I have to I think about it a lot more than I would with a normal friend. So I want to ask yeah. you the same question as I did with a Michael Phelps. Like psychologically being in and around Bill and Bill's world, what's going on in in your noggin, good and bad? Yeah, no, I mean Bill is like you know again I can name probably five six people that have been intricate to sort of shape my beliefs and and sort of rethink 
life and understand things. So, you know, the thing about Bill, I'll just say the most is you know, he's, he's one of my, my best friends to this day. And we, we talk a lot and he just has a way to make you think of things differently. You know, his book die with zero is a really great read, really interesting, but just like, you know, he'll be like, all right, if I, if I eat this piece of pizza, this is like an hour on the treadmill of my time or, you know, my thinking about calculating like what his hourly is in general, and then like using to equate time and, 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 uh, and, and, and how he just, how he processes it. I never really thought of stuff like that. And just sort of, uh, he, he had a, a way of really making me think about what's possible. And just like his whole story too. Like, I mean, he was, you know, on the trading floors in New York, city basically as you know at the very bottom he was a limo driver he was like homeless at one point or living under a bridge and like what all this stuff like he was just basically from jersey city poor an intelligent guy and basically took chance like about risk and, and and all these different things sort of thinking about you know just able to process life and understand like which pockets and times you want to take more risk less risk uh, and just sort of understanding you know how where he gets to and what he's done it's you know it doesn't just happen by accident you got to take some chances you got to calculate things and you got to make some difficult decisions and you know just like these type of things of course it rubs off on you that's why i always say like who you are you hang out with the five you're like the five people you hang out the most like you know being around very successful and intelligent and interesting people um there's no doubt these type of things sort of rub off on you. You just kind of have a access to see things. You pick up on things, you ask questions and, you know, ultimately um, again, he would be, you know, Mike, uh, Bill, I could say Antonio, I could name five, six, seven guys. People would know of some that they wouldn't know of, you know, some of my closest friends where I've learned a lot from and, and just invaluable stuff. And, and again, seeing them, like you're mentioning multimillionaires, how do they make their business? How did it start? What was the challenges? What were the, where, where did they almost give up? Did they give up? Did they change? Did they move? Did they have to go to somewhere they didn't want to go to do it? Did they just, you know, take a risk, a uh, calculated risk, Kelly criterion, you know, about how much bet sizes you make in different spots. So like you know, all these type of things are very, very powerful and, and very, um, you know, beneficial, uh, to, to sort of, um, have access to for sure. So yeah, I would say, you know, those things in general, you know, Bill is just one of those guys that, you know, I, I remember we did the, the stream boat and we had Bill, mm. you know, we, some guys came, I remember there was a guy, uh, Ryan there who came and he, it changed his life. He was in like a relationship he wasn't that happy with or something, just things weren't exactly right. And he like shifted it, talking with Bill for like the two days and being around, he like changed his whole life when he got out and he like sent messages to us. He's like, ah, I was living a lie. You know, like I didn't, I just, like, just like little things that like a little piece of knowledge or a tidbit he may say may shift, you know, your life. And he has that type of power. There's not a lot of guys and people I think that, you know, can, uh, have that sort of impact on people very quickly. And I'd say he's, he's for sure one of those people that, that can do that. It's, I mean, there's money and there's money and his money is like, you know, kind of like next level money. Like, is there a challenge around that? So for example, I know whenever I have dinner with one of my uh, friends who's uh, very, very, very wealthy, like we're always fighting over who's paying the bill, for example, like there's a part of me that's like, no, no, I, I've got to pay this bill. And then there's another aspect of it. Well, this is fucking stupid because this, this bill means nothing to me. Um, and it can hurt you. And we get into that whole thing. Like, where was you on any challenges with hanging around? Yeah, with man, you know, like again, Bill is one of those guys and, and other people too, where it's so funny because you're right. Like Bill's uh, significantly more wealthy, like to the to the degree, right? But it's like, it's also, you know, Bill, I've had a lot of great opportunities and done lots. So like Bill, for example, I'll like never let him pay for a meal because like, I just feel like that's the least I can do. And also probably a lot of people, he's taking care of so much stuff for people all the time. So, you know, certain things, I just think it's, a, it's like a respect thing in ways, but obviously, yeah, you're right. It's kind of funny too, like with your, with people, uh, it, and it goes both ways. Cause there's people that I'm with and friends with that. I know I'm significantly more well off and like, it's going to hurt them. Like a hundred dollar go out a hundred a person meal is a big deal, you know? And, and it's all relative though. Right. I think like there's all different levels all the way. And that's why it's nice because like certain, certain friends and certain people, I want to always be overly generous and do whatever I can at all times, because, you know, I've had that, um, that done for me with a lot of my friends that are significantly in better spots and want to help me. And so I think you just kind of like, sort of like the pay it forward mentality. Um, but in terms of that, like, yeah, I think, uh, I, I see what you're saying. And, you know, again, I try the people that have always helped me and do stuff, even if they're way, way more well off or whatnot, I'm going to go out of my way to try to be as nice and generous and just sort of show appreciation because, you know, there's certain, certain people you can't pay back, right? Like you just stuff they've done opportunities they give you yeah, yeah. No matter what you do, you could really never, like actually give that back. And, and yeah, I do think it's important to not be, you know, you don't want to be that person either. It's like a freeloader. That's like, 
never pain and, and be that. Cause that, that's something just never would want to have happen. And, uh, you know, that's, that's important to me, I think to, to do that. So, um, yeah. Jeff Gross, back in the day, he picked up a Sklansky book to learn how to play poker. But today, books are old hat. If you want to learn how to be a top, top poker player, you've got to learn from the best. And they all reside at Run It Once Training. Sign up today and you will receive two new training videos on a daily basis, folks, including three elite videos and one from the Michael Phelps of poker himself, Mr. Philip Galfon. So the link you're looking for for this one is once.run forward slash hero learn i i i have like normal friends you know and in i've never been in a spot where i've had to ask people to lend me money that often i think like i've only ever asked my dad to lend me money once in my life um but and i think maybe i've gone to friends like once or twice so then if if i would go to my normal friends once or twice to ask him to lend me some money because i'm a bit stuck right and then all of a sudden i have a multi-millionaire friend there is a part of me that's like Oh, I can't ask this guy because because he'll you know I don't want him to think that I'm friends with him because he's a multimillionaire. And then yeah. obviously the guy's just like, "What the fuck, you idiot!" You know what I mean? Like, but that, that again, I think that likely goes back to my childhood need to be validated and to be approved upon. Whereas when you grew up, it seemed like your your upbringing was much more um, healthy, and you you were more of an inside out person. That's what comes across to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're right. It's a, it's a very interesting thing. This like the validation sort of stuff. It's a, it's, a, you know, like the social dilemma and then also looking at Started watching New York that Times. last night. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's very interesting. The New York times, um, as well, like the, you know, showing like the likes and the hearts and the followers and all this stuff. It is kind of, it's like, it's one of those things where it's like a bit of a trap too. Cause it's like, you want to do it. You want to, you know, what are you really working for? Yeah. It, it's, it's a, it's a hard thing. Cause you don't want to get caught up in that trap and being superficial and, you know, like letting that affect your moods and whatnot. But then, you know, as like someone who does, you do podcasts, you do content, of course, like if you put out a podcast and you've been doing it for two years and you're getting, you know, only eight people are watching it, that's probably a sign that, you know, maybe it's just not for you or it's not your calling. Um, but you know, at the same time, like you have to kind of really put a lot of work to understand it, to get results. And so like there are benchmarks, you know, professional athletes, they get measured on their statistics, how many points per game, rebounds per game, minutes per game, how, you know, so it's like, it's just part of how, you know, it's part of a game and part of a, a, a system. And, you know, you do want to, uh, you do want to do good work and you want to be, be give, give value for people. And you also want to have balance. I think balance is one of the keys in life. And that's something easier said than done. A lot of the time is when you want to do this stuff, like you, you have a lot going on. I mean, you're very organized from my experience with you and just like the alerts and the setting the calendar to schedule things. And I see different people, all different types of people, all different types of systems. Some work better than others. The, and, 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 you know, you teach your own, right. You have your own systems, mm. like your organizational tools, but it's very easy to get over, to get in balance. Like for me, especially, you know, I see, I see stuff going on where, um, you know, I, 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 uh, you know, I just, I, it's hard. Cause like, you know, again, this time's valuable. You have a four-year-old, like they're not going to be four forever, but you do the podcast today. Do you do two? Do you, do you then put out, you know, how much work and time and, and, and balance are you getting and trying to find the schedule to balance it all. Yeah. It's hard. Cause like, also you're basically investing in your future, you know, cause you see guys like Bill, guys like Phelps, guys like, you know, again, ton of people are successful and do well. And in your mind, you're like, Oh, a little more. Cause like really what you do now really does provide for the future, but you don't want to just like only do this and then miss it. And then you're like, Oh, okay. I'm older and I have more wealth than maybe I even need or what would make me happy, but I miss this stuff. So like balance mm -hmm. to me is the most important word in life. And you know, that's, that's a bit of a tricky formula and to, to, to really decide what is right in the moment and, and what is worth your time versus your experience versus your, 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 uh, your whole thing. So I think that's, that's something that is very, very hard to sort of get, get right. Yeah. It's very difficult. I I have a, a, a washing basket full of underwear wedged against the door right here to stop my daughter from gate crashing as i have my my wife just beyond here doing a webinar on liver cleanse and my daughter downstairs with right. her grandma and that's how it shit rolls right you know that's how shit rolls and we'll yeah. look back at this in one day and, and have a good laugh about it um yes. i i'm a true believer that to go through life if you really want to make it in whatever area you want to make it in, whether that's just, you know, you want to just live a whole hearted, beautiful existence, you know, living in the woods on your own type of thing. Well, not on your own. Um, right. But 
the people you meet along the way are really integral to that. Now, I'm really interested. I've asked you this question before in, in another interview, but I'll ask you again uh, because we're talking about your life in, in general. You started out as a lonely child, right, as an only child, not a lonely child, an only child. Um, and then people do, don't know, they, they thin slice that and they're like, oh, yeah, that person's going to struggle or they've been too spoiled or whatever. Um, and then so you, you come from that kind of um, that normality and then you go through life, and it is pretty incredible the people you've met along the way. So, um, you know, the greatest Olympiad and one of the most famous people in the world, probably the most famous sportsman in the world at his time, right? Yeah. You've got Bill. You've got people like Antonio. Um, what's going on there, Jeff? Because I, I actually don't believe this is just variance. <laughs> I don't believe it's luck. What are you doing that that – that people anyway. of such substance look at you and think, I, I want to be friends with this guy. What's going on? Well, I mean, so yeah, it, it's obviously when you look at it like that, I mean, it, it is, it's, it's funny. It's flattering or funny to hear like that, but I don't really think like that. I also just, I do think it's more about uh, being, being right, the right place, right time and having similar interests and goals. And, and, and you know, that's, that's sort of uh it, I think it kind of builds off each other. And again, a lot of these guys and names you're mentioning are also friends, right? Or, or know each other either through me or I know them through them or whatever. So you know, I think if you find good people and you're in a, you know, you, you, you're, you're a good person, you provide positive vibes, if you would, like if you're just like an upbeat person, the guy who's like complaining about bad beats and negative and, you know, talking about like whatever guys that like, I, I just like, love good people. I love interesting things. And I think that's something that, you know, when you hang out with me, that's just like what you're going to get. I'm going to be upbeat. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be positive. I'm going to have something new, interesting. And, and it just sort of like webs, like all of a sudden it's all about really providing value. Like if you're with somebody, are they, is it fun? Are you having a good time? Are you learning new things? Are you getting introduced to new things and opportunities? Uh, do you, do you enjoy their outlook on life? Do you enjoy their, their jokes, their humor, their, their light, all these things kind of playing. And like, again, with time, as you get older, you start realizing, well, now it's like a big deal to go on a, to meet with a friend, to, to hang out. Like, all right, I have my son, I have my wife, I have my, this, I have my work. I have all these things. So like my extra time is so limited that mm. like when you, you really want to like somebody, if you're going to hang out with them, because it's not, it's, you yeah, know, yeah. It's like, and back in the day, you're in high school, out of college. It's like, all right, I'm just free all the time you know, I'm hanging out, like we're talking about whatever, nothing or this. So, so I think, but I don't really know how to answer your question. I will say that my nickname that Antonio kind of actually Matt Waxman, I think coined it. And then Antonio sort of made it, it, it was PBF professional best friend, just sort of, uh, along to say what you're saying, like almost like I'm in a lot of people's top fives, like people like very close with a lot of people. Um, and that also takes a lot of, uh, I don't want to use the word work, but that takes a lot of time. You know, sending, knowing when people's birthdays are, checking in with people, calling them, knowing if someone's going through something hard or difficult, you're there for them. Uh, these are all things that, you know, it does take a lot of time. And, you know, my phone's very active. My Antonio actually named my phone Mochi. Um, I think we had a Japanese restaurant, but he nicknamed that. So like, and he would always, you know, I was almost like not being present so much. I was always on my phone or so often, but yeah, I mean, I'm pretty active, you know, within, uh, within like my friends and I try to keep, keep, um, keep up with, with, with with people and keep up with their 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 lives, their children's lives. Um, send them, you know, just 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 check in and the little things like little and obviously like guys like Phelps or or Bill or Antonio. You know, these guys have what they want. You know, you're not going to get them like some like expensive gift, but the thought process, like the thought, giving them like mm. a you know printing out photos. I'll just give you an example. Like a lot of times, I'll like print out, go through every once in a while, and I'll go to CVS and I'll print out like hundreds of photos from like a year or two. And I'll just like, when I see my friends, I'll give them like the hard copy photos of like from memory and stuff like that. You know, I don't think a lot of people just, you know, I like to go the extra mile. And, and, you know, again, these are guys, some of the names I mentioned, I can't really ever pay back, like in terms of what they've, they've provided me in terms of opportunity and, and contacts. And, and, uh, you just try to do your best all the time and, and, and let them know, show them you're appreciative and you know that you're not just trying to take advantage of them. And again, I think that's very common. People try to take advantage of people a lot. So mm. I, I like to believe that that's like a fee, a quality people see in me that that's not, you know, that I, that I genuinely am a good person and genuinely have their best interest and their family's best interest. And will go out of my way, um, to help people whenever I can, whether, you know, just in general, and, and I think they like too how you treat the waitress, how you treat an Uber driver. These are type of things that are important. And, and, and you know, again, I just try to be, be nice to, to everyone around me and, and be positive. And uh, that, that's so I don't know if that, that would be my guess. I don't really know what else to say, but uh, I do think this part of that is just snowballing 
with a group and core of people that have similar interests that sort of uh, hang out together and, and, and have a common goal. So I think that's part of that too. There's a lot of like, it's not always just me, like someone will introduce me. You know, I met Bill through Antonio, Mike met uh, so-and-so through me. And, and now they're all friends and different things. Like, again, they're putting people that are, that are want the best for everyone, not trying to just take that are all constantly giving. And that, that, that creates a nice nucleus and a nice kind of core of a relationship. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's really important. I mean, I just want to touch upon this a little bit, actually, because I think in my life, when I was a drinker, I had a certain group of friends and I hang around in a certain environment, which I would say toxic, right? And then when I stopped drinking, I then attract different friends and I hang around in different environments. And then when I put those friends together, they're always going to gel. Like I look at my different tributaries of friendships and I know they're going to gel because we all have something together. And then I look at the poker world and I, and I, and particularly when I was in there as a, as a writer and an interviewer, I, I felt this, but I imagine poker players feel it all the time. It's like, who is genuine here? Who is authentic here? Who is a really, who is a real close buddy and who isn't right. So I think you need to kind of like, really build this sense up as you evolve and grow as a human being of like who you can trust and, and who is real and who isn't real. And it it seems like you're very good at that. Well, yeah. And, and, and that's a, that's a good point, but that's what I'm saying too. It's like, even let's just take in a poker dynamic community, there's always going to be a group of friends where someone's better than the others, or it's pretty clear that someone's going to be more experienced, have better results, have more tricks. So it's like, if you're a guy that's uh, just always taking, always asking, never like doing some of this, you know, running the solutions, coming up with answers, providing value or bringing other stuff like, you know, that's going to show up pretty fast. So I think that's something that, you know, within like the, the top players in the groups are pretty balanced and there's a lot of giving and sharing and taking. But if you're always asking this guy for secrets, but you learn something and you don't want to share it or you're not being uh, transparent with stuff or, you know, you don't give, you know, so there's a lot of that too about giving pieces, being mm-hmm. fair, having opportunities to do things, not always wanting the best of it. You know, like within, there's a lot of groups and a lot of people want to bet all the time. You know, if you're able to give some action, give people, you know, sweats and, and, and all that, like it just, there's just a lot that goes into it. It's just kind of like a ongoing formula that, that I think is, it just fits into one pie. And, you know, again, you want to give people net good bets, good opportunities, good spots. If you're just always taking, or you're not really sharing and doing stuff, then you know, I think that's like abundance is the key. And that's something too, like with at the top and a lot of these games and cash games, like it's a lot of opportunities. Sometimes people take pieces of another, sometimes like, Hey, I got a great game. You can have a sweat or like, do you want a sweat of this game? Like, you know, kind of do it, trying to be, trying to be fair to people that, uh, that do that, that are, that are good, you know, good to you. You want to be good too as well. Yeah. I think that's really important for, you know, for people listening to this, you know, who are thinking to themselves, like, how can I become a professional poker player or how can I excel in my business? How can I become my the CEO, of the company I work for? How can I just get a job? Whatever it is, like, does this, whilst you can look at like Jeff's story, for example, and go, oh, right. It, his, his, the way that he got, went through life, just, it just happened, right. It's just organically happened. Right. Um, However, you can still look at that and you can still have processes in place, whether that be journaling or meditation or prayer or whatever, to just check in with yourself and be like, how is my life going right now? How, how am I showing up in relationships? How, how are my relationships? Am I providing value? Like you just you just said there, um, don't be the guy who's always asking, is asking the questions all the time and keeping your value. And I wrote that down. I'm like, oh, that's something I do sometimes in some areas of my life not all of them. Right. So I just urge people listening to this to just be like, okay, let's just check in with myself and just ask myself, where am I showing up in my friendships? Am I showing up out of scarcity, abundance? I I will, I will show you, I will, I will say, um, that quite the, the course that I did was very powerful. And that was like the main thing at the moment is to get in, to get honest feedback. How, how are you showing up? To people because that's very difficult. It's very difficult to have open, honest conversations to your friends, how they're showing up first of all, or for them to accept it or, you know, for you to sit, share that. So when you get to go into like a forum where people are just don't really know you don't have any, they're not afraid to say, Hey, you're selfish or, Hey, you know, you're doing this or, Hey, you're, you're, you're always on your phone or, Hey, you're not present or that, you know, it's good to get feedback from people that, that are able to take that, uh, share with you that. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things that was really good. And also just to your point, like, you know, again, in poker, there's a lot of predatory things. There's a lot of things that are not genuine. There's a lot of people trying to do different stuff, take angles and do things, right? Which is it's just when anytime there's money, 
in stuff. There's going to be sort of this type of environment, but you know, to your point, or just to sort of say like Phelps, for example, I didn't know who Mike was. I honestly, I lived in, I, my, I grew up in Michigan. I didn't even know who he was. I didn't remember him from the last Olympics, even though he had already won in 04, six gold and two bronze. I honestly didn't even remember that or hear about that. I didn't go to Windsor. Oh, I hear Michael Phelps is there. And like, I'm going to try to get his table and try to play with him and befriend him. You know, like I didn't even know him or, or it didn't even, that doesn't, have, same thing with Bill. I didn't know who Bill was and I was in poker already. And I went to this course and it wasn't like, hey, I want to, Bill's going and I'm going to try to, like, I show up and we hit it off. And I didn't even know, you know, how, whatever, like he, that he's ultra wealthy and that he plays in these crazy games. And there was even a game. So like, these are the type of things I'm talking about. It's easy, I think, looking on an outside or judging someone or, you know, nowadays, or of course, once you're within a circle or a mix, you know, who's kind of who, and like, you can sort of, you know, go and do different things or whatever. But there's just a point, like, someone who might say like, Oh, this, you know, he's a, he wants to whatever. It's just like, no, like I didn't, you know, I didn't know them. I don't even, I'm not targeting people. I'm not like trying and, and stuff like that does happen where people, you know, but even then it's like the, to your point, it's not even easy. A lot of these people you can't even get access to, right? Yeah. Like you're not, they just, they're, they're guard. So up like Mike is so guarded. Like yeah. you're not going to get to like, hang out. Like you don't just go meet him at a charity event and you know, like he's going to, you're going to be friends. Like, mm. And so it's, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think it's part of that is uh, it's a little bit of um, right place, right time. And uh, it's also just sort of, um, again, once you get in with, once you know people and, you know, actually I'll say this because this is kind of messed up in a way. It's kind of like, it comes across very bizarre. I don't know if you've, have you had Antonio on your show before? I I haven't had him on this show. He said it was too complicated for him. But I I have had I have spoken to him a few times for interviews. Yeah, so like I'll see. give you an example. Antonio, um, who's one of my best friends, he has a system, and he's he'll talk about this and whatnot. Like he has like a ranking system for his friends, like a one to twenty five. He has calls his top twenty five. It sounds super terrible and superficial, right? It sounds like kind of like what the hell? Like what do you mean? I know a lot of people are like it's so ridiculous, so crazy. That sounds terrible, but you know it makes a lot of sense. And really we all have it. We just don't say it, but yeah, you have your best friend. Have it. We all you, have, you it. have your best friend. You know, in your wedding, who would be your top, your guy, your best friend, mm -hmm. you know, if you go on these trips, like, listen, different people are different situations and different groups and, and dynamics. But like, if Antonio tells me, Hey, this is like my number two, I'm going to immediately be like, all right, this dude's the real deal. Like he's been vetted. He trusts him. He's known him forever. And that's like valuable in, in some way. Like I grant it, you could argue, well, that's going to sway your opinion because he's like already telling you, but you see what I'm saying? Like, it's like a kind of by association, certain people that I know are friends with someone else. Like I already know that they've done their due diligence. They trust the person. They like them. They're honest. They're probably very, you know, all these things. So like, just to kind of give a little context too, like kind of having a, a system. I, I almost look at it more like tiers. Like, is it your, one of your you know core? Is it one of your kind of friends outer? So I think the ranking's a little wild. Like what's the difference between eight and nine, you know, it gets a little kind of funny, but at the same time, the, the point is there that you can sort of give people credibility um, sort of quickly based on these type of things, which is important for business or deals or, or understanding. And I think that's a kind of a, kind of a bizarre thing that I actually know a lot of people will hear this, say it's, it's trash. I don't want to do it. And then they'll go make a to top 25. And like, oh, <laughs> I love this. well, it, it's interesting you say this because, you know, I work in the field of addiction and, um, I, I run this six month workshop called the stride method for addictions. And one of our assignments is called status where we, we bring to the forefront, this hierarchical structure we have of where we exist within our friends framework and we bring it out of the subconscious and we bring it to the conscious and we say right where do you think you are because mm. it's really important to know where you are because when you stop drinking or smoking or taking drugs you're gonna you that is gonna matter like how like if i'm in a group of people and i think that i'm suddenly gonna drop down that that pecking order because i stopped drinking then I'm not going to stop drinking. So that is something that we need to deal with. So it's really interesting that you say that Antonio is just already out there because I, I think there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, I did a, uh, I did a, uh, I, I did a one year. Oh, there's my son. Baby crying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. He, uh, you know, I did, a, I did a one year, a one year, no drinking thing. That was that, that, that changed my life. Cause that was, uh, it was a bet, but it was 2013 or 14, I think Cinco de Mile to Cinco de Mile, basically. And I was in Mexico and it came up and uh, I, 
you know, that was awkward for me because like at that time, my friends, we'd go out to dinner. It was just like, oh, okay, I'll have four rum and Cokes or, you know, three uh, vodka sodas, like as a default, just yeah. like, and then it would, then the night would turn in and then it'd be ripping shots. And like, it was just a phase. I mean, it was part of my life. It was, you know, I was having fun. I was single and going out and getting, getting kind of wrecked and having fun. And just like, I was just doing it though out of like habit because everyone else was doing it. I didn't really think about it. I wasn't thinking mm. about my body. I wasn't thinking about the side effects. Just like kind of like I had no responsibilities and it was just sort of like part of my stick. And then all of a sudden I stopped and it was like a little bit of weird because like the friends I was with were doing that a fair amount. And like, it was kind of weird to have to explain it. We'd go out, we'd be in Cabo or something, be going out on the golf course and have people be drinking. I'd be like, oh, I'm not. And they'd be like, this guy, you know, cause they kind of almost look at you and there is, is this something wrong with you. Yeah. Like, or what, what do you mean? And then I'd be like, Oh, it's a bet. And they'd be like, Duh. and then, and then shortly though, in the next year, two or three, a few of my other friends just stopped drinking or also whatever, or would barely drink. And, you know, almost like it was like a, I feel like it was like almost an, but it was uncomfortable at times because it mm. was like a lot of these scenes where you want to have a drink or, you know, just people are doing it and it, and it, and it kind of felt, it felt, it felt, funny it didn't feel natural to not do it but then after a while i basically stopped drinking and then sure i'll have a drink at a wedding or like if my but you know one of my buddies and we'll go out and have a beer or something but like i'm just not default dinner three cocktails as like just to do it like, i didn't even know i was doing it like there's nights we just like hang out go to drink i didn't really like it you know i was just ordering yeah. and i'd much prefer to have water than uh than a, than a drink but like i was doing this for like a couple of years like my dad was almost worried about me um so yeah it's uh yeah but, but yeah, so that there you are. Gam gambling can be used to f the force of good <laughs> sometimes, you know. Um, I was reading a uh, book with my daughter last night. She's so she's so smart. Like um, I left it on a cliffhanger. So there's this little story about these these kids who live in there. They go to visit this treehouse. It's like a time machine. Mm -hmm. So they they read a book about knights and castles, and then the the, the treehouse takes them there. And this little boy, he fell out of the castle and landed in a splash. And I left the story there. And she's mm -hmm. like, what the fuck, dad? Like, you've got to keep reading this story. I'm like, no, no, we'll read it tomorrow night. I left her like in this kind of like all is lost moment, right? She doesn't know what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. What has been your all is lost moment in your life where people were like, oh, shit, he's just hit the moat. I don't know if he's going to get back up or not. Uh, man, a couple, I mean, I think I sort of touched on it, uh, but I could think of another, but was the, the black Friday. That was like a real, like, Whoa. Like I remember being in New York city at the time with one of my best friends, Tim Begley. He was also kind of just playing poker for a living, played basketball professionally, uh, was, was staked and did really well. And was one of my, one of my core guys that would hang out. I go up there, play. We just, you know, it was great. We'd be in New York city, play online, go out, have a good time. We we're sort of in the same period out of college, not really sure. Uh, and I just remember being there when that like woke up the DOJ and black Friday. And that was like, you know, I think that's one of the, the, uh, the moments about, you know, you don't know, it's not about what happens, not about how you, it's how you react to what happens, uh, in bad situations. So I think that's like the most vivid, one that 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 sort of time period that shifted my life and, and got me back on track and playing more live and traveling and taking care of myself um that was sort of an aha one um i'd say the other one maybe the most interesting and i don't want to say like it kind of hits the point as well um i think this is my most fascinating poker sort of tale or story or moment although the money was really big and it was significant you know again i had some pieces sold this wasn't like put me down or out, but the actual situation of what happened, which I feel like I can share now because it's uh, been been a bit and, 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 and later. And I, I maybe mentioned this a little before was a, a, actually a hand in January of last year, uh, playing a private game in the Bahamas on a boat in the, in the harbor there at the, in the Bahamas. And um, I was, I got to play in the game. It was a very good game, private game, hundred K min buy-in um, cash game. And uh, I got to play actually Bill, I think was with me. He came, we played that night and a couple other guys like uh, maybe Evan Mathis, Jason Koontz, and they got to hop in the game and I got to play. Um, and, and I remember I was up like 106, I was up like 65,000. I get two aces. Uh, of course, always with aces, right? Something going to happen crazy. So it was like a 501 K with the one K ante big blind ante. There was a limp for a thousand, a raise to 4,000 and Rob Young actually just called 4,000. Okay. I have aces in middle position. I make it 20,000 folds around to Rob. He shoves all in for a hundred. He puts me all in, you know, he had me covered and I didn't really know Rob. I had played once 200, 400 televised at playground poker with him. Didn't have his number. 
didn't speak to him. We knew of each other, but you know, not, not, not more than that. Never, never even really a convo. Uh, and we turned the cards over. He's got Kings. I've got aces it was kind of bizarre. He flatted Kings on a raise on the straddle. I had aces happen to have my cooler on. and he's, and I look at him and, you know, it was a big pop for me. Cause I, it was a big game. I mean, I'm, and I, and I was just like, I was like, what, look, you want to run it twice or whatever? He's like, I, he goes, he goes one time. And I go, okay, like, you know, man, shit, I'm, I got a, I got a baby doing three months. My first born is a huge, <laughs> like, you can't really run it two times, really. Like, you don't want, and I'm ahead too, you know, like, yeah, I'm yeah. behind it. It's like the guy doesn't want to run it. It's a better deal for him, really. So he runs it once and uh, flops a king, rivers a king, makes quads. I'm just sitting there kind of like, whatever. I end up, you know, rebuying and losing a couple hundred thousand instead of being up like 250 if I had won that pot or whatever. And uh, so in that moment, you know, I was pretty tilted because all around, I was like, what the hell? Like I, I get aces all in pre-flop. I lose the guy won't run it twice. And he actually hit quads. I would have won the set, you know, whatever. So I'm just like kind of steamed up. Like it's kind of crazy, but like Rob and I were talking then Robo, Andrew Robo was like joking, like, Hey, uh, you know, Rob, you should pay, pay Jeff with his own money and, and hire him to uh, bring him over to to party. And, you know, it's interesting because this was January, like 13th, 14th. I actually had busted the PCA, remember that special 25K yeah, like, that, dude, big yeah. event? I busted Aces the Kings two days before in that tournament, the biggest tournament ever, like prize pool and whatever. So I'm not having a great week there. And uh, and then the thing is, though, because I lost in the game, I got to play the next day. And during the, during the night, you know, again, like I said, poker is a lot about w- golf too, similar. You handle how someone wins, how they lose, how do they handle themselves at the table? How do they, how do they act? Like all these things. So Rob and I got to know each other a bit. And then I got to come back the next day because I had lost. You know, I didn't have my guys weren't in, even there anymore, but like I was stuck in the game. They let me play again. I won, came back, did okay, whatever. And like Rob and I kept talking and then Rob was, you know, conversation comes up and my deal with poker stars was up January 31st, end of January. I had my meetings down there with the team, like scheduled meetings, renew contract was being talked about coming up with the terms, the deal, whatever. And, uh, then all of a sudden Rob starts saying, Hey, like, you know, I haven't done Twitch and people, I don't think know this maybe about party poker. Rob was aware of Twitch party poker was aware of that whole thing. But Rob's point was our software wasn't up to par. Our guarantees weren't really there. Why am I going to spend all this money and hire streamers and stuff to promote a product that I'm not really proud of, or like, I'm not comfortable with at the moment. So kind of right place, right time lucky that hand happens, get to know Rob. We play the next day, take a meeting or two. And then he flew to Miami a week later. But after, you know, I had gone home at the time, uh, we met up and kind of worked out a deal and, you know, basically said, Hey, do you want to run uh, Twitch team online? And I said, look, you need to get this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, you need to do that. Here's how much. And he was just like, done, 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 done. No <laughs> even negotiations on that. And then next thing you know, like, you know, it's just a much better situation. Like I, yeah. I, cause again, my stuff with, with stars, um, and being able to kind of pigeonholed being within the U S and what they wanted me to do. Whereas like what I wanted to do there was, was create a podcast. I wanted to, to venture out. I wanted to help sort of build the, the ideas and, and help with the team and manage and, and grow, you know? So like, it was more what I wanted to do. And it was just like the perfect fit and the right time. And, you know, literally within two weeks, again, this is like, I could, I can't make it up. There was no contact with Rob. I wasn't shopping other deals. I was going to resign with stars. I just hadn't even thought of considering anything and just like complete randomness that happened. So, you know, which was, I got a great deal, did a three-year deal signed with Rob and, you know, that's up in next February. Who knows? I, I, I'm very happy here and hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. So whatever, but like that, those two things, Black Friday and that hand, I think those are like the, the clear two sort of moments of like in the moment, really bad. And then sort of looking back and just kind of, uh, kind of looking like, all right, well, man, here's another example, something that seems bad that really is the best thing. And that's why I think like with relationships, with jobs, with other things, you know, losing people, like just whatever it may be, that seems like the worst in the world. Generally, if you really sit back, kind of breathe, meditate on it, think about it, um, it can, it can shift and things can turn uh, and and be a, be a positive. So I think that's, uh, that's uh, those two things. Jeff. I'm going to leave it there. I think that is a beautiful story to end it. I just want to thank you uh, for being um, really open and talking from your heart and sharing a lot of personal stories. And everybody, this is Jeff Gross and his Heroes Journey. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks, Lee.